Good morning again. It is a blessing to be together this morning. Uh, Please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 22. We're going to start in verse 66 this morning. Luke 22, 66. When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council. And they said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, You said that I am. And they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and to the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea from Galilee even to this place. Let us bow together. Righteous Heavenly Father, we thank You for the blessings You've given us today. We thank You for bringing us together to worship You. And I pray that our worship has been pleasing and acceptable to You and that we have been encouraging each other to righteousness, to love, and to good works. Father, as we consider the the faithlessness of the men that we've just read about in these passages, I pray that we hold fast to our confession. Righteous Father, You have given us the confession of faith that Your Son is Jesus of Nazareth, that Jesus is Your Messiah, the Christ, Your Anointed One, that You sent Him to live among men, to live a perfect life and offer Himself as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. Father, we confess this before You and we confess this before men. And I pray, Father, that we always hold fast to this confession, that it drives our lives. Father, we look forward to that great day when we will be with You in eternity. For Father, we know that Your Son not only died for us, but also lives for us, that He was raised on the third day, that we too might have newness of life. We pray that You hasten the day, Father, uh, when You send Your Son again and we join You in eternity. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So like I said, it is a blessing to be together. And it is a blessing to you know, to have brothers here who can lead and can serve. And I want to say just a few words, you know, before we jump into the text itself. Um, but for you know, for everybody that you see, you know, leading up at the head of the congregation, uh, they would not be there without their mothers. I mean, literally, because you know that's just the way things work, right? But um, I'm, I'm reminded of what Paul says to Timothy about the role of his mother and his grandmother in the formation of his faith. Uh, and tonight we're going to read a passage where, as Luke records it, um, and as the other gospel writers record it, the first people to become aware of Jesus' resurrection, the first people to know that the tomb was empty because Jesus lived, the first people to bring that message to others were women. Namely, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James. And so, you know, those of you that are here that have uh, raised young ones in the faith, you know, we are so thankful for what you do uh, because you are you are a big part of equipping us to do what we need to do. And Paul, 
Yeah, part, specifically, part of what Paul tells Timothy is to remember the confession that he learned from his grandmother and his mother, the understanding of the Scriptures that he received from them. And what we're going to be focusing on in this text today is the confession of faith. Now, on the face of it, it doesn't look like we find the confession of faith um, in these passages, because in a sense, we don't. We find the antithesis of that confession. Uh, But it is an antithesis. In other words, it starts with the confession of faith and then turns around and repudiates it. It says the opposite. So We'll get to that in just a second. Um, I want us to kind of get up to speed here and explain how we've gotten to this point. Uh, Because the passage that we read opens with Jesus imprisoned. Uh, Jesus has been arrested and He is standing trial before the Sanhedrin. The way that we get to this point is that Jesus' opponents have been frustrated with Him ever since He entered Jerusalem, ever since He first set foot in the temple. The first thing that we read Jesus doing whenever He enters Jerusalem at the end of Luke chapter 19 is that He enters the temple in verse 45, and He began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. He goes in and He cleanses the temple. He drives out these money changers, these people that are there in the place of God's worship to make a dime. He drives them out and he begins teaching in the temple, the text tells us. He was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him. But they did not find anything they could do for all the people were hanging on his words. This begins this pattern of confrontation between Jesus and the chief priests in the temple. Because they all hate Jesus, with few exceptions that we read about later in the Gospel. They all hate Jesus, but they can't do anything about it because the public loves Him and they're afraid of what the public will do if they publicly deal with Jesus. In fact, we read that if we continue in Luke 20, the first eight verses, one day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, tell us by what authority you do these things or who it is that gave you this authority. He answered them, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he'll say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And then skip down to verse 19. All right, so Jesus tells this parable that we studied about a couple of Sundays ago, the parable of the wicked vine dressers, the wicked tenants. And the, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, in verse 19... Excuse me. Uh, sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against him. But they feared the people, so they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere, that they might catch him in something he did, so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. All right? They hate Jesus. But the public loves him and they fear the public. And they're in fact so afraid of the public that they are unwilling to stand for whatever they think is the truth. Jesus asks them that question, the baptism of John, is it from heaven or from man? And they will not tell what they think. Whatever they think is the truth, they won't stand up for it because they are afraid. And because, well, they're afraid of the people if they answer in the negative, they're also afraid of the shame. They're afraid of what Jesus is going to say to them if they answer in the positive. 
So they're trying to find some way to trip him up in his public ministry. They start asking him questions, uh, things like rendering taxes to Caesar, or the question that the Sadducees ask about the seven brothers who all married you know, the same widow, um, and you know they all pass away without um, bearing any children, and they've got this question: you know, in the resurrection, whose wife is she? And all of this is to try to trip Jesus. Jesus up so that they don't have to deal with him. They basically make him deal with himself um, so that they can justifiably, before the public, deliver him over to Pilate and have him put to death. But it doesn't work. In verse 39, after Jesus has given his answer about the resurrection, and some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well. For they no longer dared to ask him any question. All right, they saw that that tactic was not going to work. So as we studied last Sunday, they finally have to resort to getting Jesus alone. They can't deal with him in public. They are afraid of the people. And they can't get Jesus to trip up in what he's preaching. And so in chapter 22 and verse 1, now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas called his chariot, who was of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. That's what this whole betrayal is about. It's not that they can't figure out who Jesus is, but it's that they need to find Jesus alone. They've had a hard time tracking his movements. They don't know when they can catch him by himself so that they can arrest him without a big fuss and bring him in for questioning without the public you know, breathing down their neck. And so that brings us to the end of chapter 22. All right, Judas betrays him. Judas knows he's going to be alone in the garden, and so he gets all of these cronies, and they're armed, and they come in and arrest Jesus so that they don't cause a big public scene. And they hold him overnight, and when day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together. That is, the Sanhedrin gathered. uh, Their court of justice, as it were gathered together to question Jesus. This is the fruit of Judas' betrayal. This is what they've been looking for. A chance to deal with him one-on-one. And if you look at the Sanhedrin's questions, they show that they understand who Jesus is. They ask Him, If you were the Christ, tell us. Now, we've been studying Luke for a long time. We've not seen any place in the Gospel up to this point where Jesus has just come out explicitly and declared, I'm the Christ. What we have seen, though, is what the chief priests have seen. We've seen what the Sanhedrin has seen, that Jesus is teaching in such a way and performing miracles in such a way that it's clear that He is God's Messiah. All right, that's, that's an answer that we come to implicitly as we're reading through the Gospel of Luke. There's something special about this guy. And that is the same conclusion that the Sanhedrin has come to. Which is why they ask, if you are the Christ, tell us. I don't know if they stop to think about this. I don't know if we stop to think about this very often. But you only, have, you only ask questions that you have a good reason to ask. All right? I wouldn't go up to any one of you and demand, if you are the Christ, tell me. Right? Not to be insulting or anything, but you know, none of you, and I certainly haven't either, but none of us have given me the impression that we are the Christ. 
Right? That's why I'm, I'm not going up to any of you and asking that question. If you were the Christ, tell me. It would make about as much sense as me coming up to you and asking you if you're a sliced onion. Right? Or if you're part of the Russian mafia. Like, I don't have any reason to believe any of those things, so why would I go up to any of you and ask questions like that? Why are they asking Jesus if He is the Christ? It is because they have heard His teaching and they have seen His miracles. They've seen that He acts like the Messiah. They don't want to admit it, but they have figured it out. They know the Scriptures. They know the promises, the things that we've been talking about in our studies of the prophets and the law. They get it. They don't want to admit that they get it. And so Jesus, sensing their insincerity, tells them that a straight answer would do them no good. He says, if I tell you, you will not believe. If I ask you, you will not answer. In other words, if I engage you in conversation, this is not going to go anywhere. And they've already proven that. Uh, and we've just seen it. He asks them that question about where is the baptism of John from? Is it from heaven or from man? And they refuse to give him a straight answer. And so he says, look, this conversation is not going to go anywhere. You're not asking me this because you really want to know the answer. So I'm not going to tell you. But then he draws them in a bit. He does exactly the same thing that he's been doing. He has been you know, saying and doing things that imply that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. And he says something that you know, if you're not grounded in the, in the law and the prophets, sounds really enigmatic. He says, from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And that prompts them to ask another question. Are you the Son of God then? Again, where is this question coming from? You don't ask questions you don't have a reason to ask. Because again, they've figured out who Jesus is. They figured out what Jesus means whenever He says, from now on the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Jesus didn't put this question in their mouths. They came up with this themselves. They understood the implications of everything that Jesus had done. And so Jesus calls them out on it. He takes their doubting question and turns it into a confession. They ask Him, are you the Son of God then? And He said to them, you say that I am. But he pins it to them. He says, you're not going to get out of this saying that you really didn't know what you were doing. Because we know what's going to happen at the end of all of this. We know that they're going to deliver him over to Pilate and he is going to be put to death. We know that they are going to be responsible for murdering the Son of God. And he tells them, you know you're responsible for this. You know. You're not ignorant of who you're talking to. You say that I am the Son of God. That's the tragic irony of all of this. They have, Jesus says, they have in essence made the confession of faith. At least they understand it. And so even though the Sanhedrin has everything that it needs to truly confess that Jesus is Lord, even though they have arrived at this conclusion themselves, they use Jesus' words to condemn Him. They take the confession of faith and they turn it on its head. They pervert it. Because they're not really confessing this in faith. They show their faithlessness by making His confession the evidence of blasphemy. 
They say, what further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from His own lips. Now what they mean is that they've heard Him blaspheme. And that's why they bring him over to Pilate. Now, they, they couch this in terms that the Roman governor would understand. They accuse him of misleading the nation. Your translation might say perverting the nation or turning the nation aside. All of those are, um, are meaningful translations of the word that's used there. Perverting, turning away forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. So that's the accusation that they make before Pilate. And we know from the other Gospels they consider him to be a blasphemer. And you have to wonder, how else do they expect to know who the Messiah is? They are sending him to death because in their eyes, he has confessed that he is the Messiah and that he is the Son of God. Again, those words never came out of his mouth directly. He pins them, uh, those words to them. They have said he is the Christ. They have said he is the Son of God. And they say, that's blasphemy. Well, they're all sitting there expecting God's Messiah. How do they expect to know when He actually shows up? It is a terribly stupid thing to say that you will know the Messiah because He never gives you the impression that He's the Messiah. But how else are they supposed to figure it out? It makes no sense for them to say that He cannot be the Messiah because He implies that He is the Messiah. It makes no sense. The only, re- the only way that that logic works is out of their faithlessness. Because they do not want to believe in the Messiah. So they turn the confession of faith the pathway of salvation into an occasion for their soul's ruin. They take this accusation before Pilate that Jesus is perverting our nation or turning the nation out of its proper path. And their accusation shows just how badly they have repudiated the confession of faith. Because this accusation that he is misleading the nation, perverting the nation, turning it aside... They elaborate with two examples. He forbids people to give tribute to Caesar. And he says that he is Christ, a king. In the first instance, they're bearing false witness about Jesus. Because what did Jesus actually say about rendering tribute to Caesar? It's one of the questions that the Pharisees asked to try to trip Jesus up in his public ministry. Back in chapter 20, they asked him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness and said to him, Show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. He said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. He told them, render tribute to Caesar. That's Caesar's coin there. Caesar's charging you taxes, pay your taxes. But they've come before Pilate and they've borne false witness against Jesus that he forbids people to give tribute to Caesar. And then they say that Jesus is turning Israel away from their true king. He says that he himself is Christ, a king. In other words, that he is a pretender. And if there is a pretender, then there has to be a true king. Who are they confessing to be the true king? They're confessing Caesar to be their true king. And by the way, the language that they use here, that he is perverting the nation, misleading the nation, puts them in exactly the same camp as Pharaoh and King Ahab. Uh, Turn to Exodus chapter 5. 
Exodus chapter 5. This is after God has commissioned Moses and Aaron to stand before Pharaoh to make God's demands known. This is their first encounter with Pharaoh. Exodus chapter 5, verse 1. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest He fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament... Pharaoh here uses exactly the same words that the members of the Sanhedrin use. He asks Moses and Aaron, why are you perverting the people away from their work? Why are you turning the people away from their work? Why are you misleading the people? Get back to your burdens. So here the Sanhedrin, they're mimicking the same words of Pharaoh. Jesus is misleading the people. He's perverting the nation. Who is the true king in Pharaoh's eyes? Pharaoh, of course. Not the God of Israel. Likewise, in 1 Kings chapter 18, this is leading up to Elijah's big encounter with the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. In 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah has already gotten Ahab and Jezebel upset at him. They're already seeking to put him to death. They've been on the hunt for him. And they managed to track him down. In 1 Kings chapter 18, in verse 17... Our English translations say, When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And again, in the Greek translation of 1 Kings 18, this exact same word is being used. Is that you, you perverter of Israel? You one who misleads Israel, who turns Israel away? In both of those cases, Moses and Elijah were turning the people back to God. They were orienting the people the way that they should have gone. They were bringing the word of the Lord. And Pharaoh and Ahab say, Ah, you are perverting the nation. You're turning them away from the way they ought to go, i.e., my way. Is who's the true king? Pharaoh says Pharaoh is the true king. Ahab says that Ahab is the true king. And the Sanhedrin, they've just fallen into the same trap. They say that Jesus is turning the people away from the true king. Now, Luke, up to this point, Luke has presented Jesus in Jerusalem as a a triumphant regal figure, a conquering king who is coming in and fighting against the false authorities of the temple. He rides in as a king, the triumphal entry that fulfills that prophecy in Zechariah. He has entered his house and cleared it out. He is the true king. You see, this charge, this charge is actually true, saying that he himself is Christ a king, because he is the king. It's not Jesus who is turning people away from the true king, but the Sanhedrin itself by confessing that Caesar is their king, by rejecting that Jesus is their king. And so Pilate, like the Sanhedrin before him, asks Jesus in Luke chapter 23, 
Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answers him exactly the same way that he answered the Sanhedrin. You have said so. Turning Pilate's question into a confession of faith. You've said it. You figured it out. Pilate, like the Sanhedrin, shows that he does not hold this confession to be true. He repudiates the confession. Because even though he says, I find no guilt in this man, he still ends up listening to the Sanhedrin. In fact, there's a there's an interesting parallel here. In chapter 23, Pilate says three times, I find no guilt in this man. And yet, in the end, he delivers him up to be crucified. It's like we've got Peter all over again, rejecting Jesus three times. Even though he doesn't find any guilt in Jesus, he's not going to let him go. Because he has repudiated the confession of faith. The call for us this morning is to hold fast to this confession. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2 that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's Philippians chapter 2 verses 10 and 11. What Paul does not tell us here is that all of that bowing and all of that confessing will come willingly. He does not tell us that all of that bowing and all of that confessing will lead to salvation. Like the chief priests, the members of the Sanhedrin, we have before us everything that we need to confess Jesus unto salvation. We know that He is God's Messiah. We know that He is the Son of God. We know, as He said before the Sanhedrin, that we shall see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power of God. We've seen the same things that the Sanhedrin saw. We've seen His teaching. We've seen His miracles. We've got all the evidence before us. So the question for us this morning, will you turn to Him and be saved? Or will you turn away as the chief priests did? Will you hold tight to that confession of faith unto salvation? Or will you repudiate that confession like the Sanhedrin did? The choice is before you this morning. Please take out your songbooks. Keith has selected number 717 when we all get to heaven as a hymn of invitation. It may be that you're here this morning and you have not made that confession of faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It may be that you have not repented of a life of sin. It may be that you have not joined with Him in the covenant of His baptism, the new covenant made with His blood. Or it may be that you're here with us and you have, you've made that confession, but like the Sanhedrin, you've turned away from it. You've not held on to it. You know that Jesus is the Son of God, but your life, that's what your lips say, but your life says something else. Your life says that you are king of your life and not Jesus. And you're in need of restoration. Whatever your need may be this morning, whether it's baptism into that covenant or restoration to that covenant, we stand ready to help you if you'll make your needs known to us by coming forward as together we stand and sing.